Ladies and gentlemen, the legendary members of my family. I was wondering how they're doing. And 1,300 people. <laughs> 1,300 people. I didn't really see it until tonight. I'm wondering about it. such a piece of art. And bless you, too. Oh, bless you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. All I did was live it. <laughs> I wonder how, I wonder, I mean, are you reliving all of this? Are you feeling elated? Are you feeling exhausted while you're watching all of this? Uh, I was so knocked out by, by the art, just the way you told the story, the way you put it together. It's 100% the, the work of these two women. And uh, the first thing is, come on. happens to me as a member of the, I'm a member of the audience, so I sit down to, and say, it's e internal and eternal, take me. That's the way I approach everything as a member of the audience, take me. And my God, have I been taken. <laughs> <laughs> how, do you, how did you approach telling this amazing story? It would have been very easy to just do a straight away chronolo chron chronology of his career, but you took a much more artistic approach. Yeah, well, uh, well Rachel and I as co-directors, we have, hadn't done a biography before. It's not a genre that, we enjoy to watch the genre, but we haven't, it's not a genre that we've actually participated in as filmmakers. Um, and what we wanted to tell Norma's story, we wanted to be part of, part of that very much. And so really it was, how do we approach uh, the story? It's a very, it's a, it's a, got such longitude, it's got such depth, um, and we didn't, you know, any film that's only 90 minutes, of course, there's, there's so much omission happening, we know that. But how do you maintain depth and, and um, also express Norman's personality in the confines of the film? Um, and so we really had to go back to the drawing board artistically uh, because, because we, it's not an observational film, because it's not cinema verite, um, and so we really had to sort of get to know Norman and really sort of think, what, what is our canvas? How do we tell the story in a, with some whimsy and some depth and some feeling? And so we came up with the aesthetic that you see in the film. Something that Norman said to us early when we first met him was that he used to, in the tapings of All in the Family and the other shows, they were live, and he would sit in the back and you would see everybody do the belly laugh. It's also in Norman's book, um, Even This I Get to Experience. And he would watch everybody lean over in their seats when they have a big laugh like you did tonight. And he loved watching that. And that stuck in our head. We thought, what if we watch others watch themselves? Or what if we film others watching Norman shows or film Norman watching his work? And that became a theme based on what you had said to us in an early interview. So we would take things that he would say and then, and he talked a lot about his childhood and we felt like he had an alter ego. So we took some liberties and brought a nine-year-old child in. And so, but Norman also is, is someone who, you might think, oh, well, he's a producer, so he's gonna be trying to be controlling the project and all of that. He didn't have editorial control, and instead of us feeling paralyzed, 
by what would what, what happen if, if we did something strange or too artistic. He actually really encourages artistry and understands artists and the process. So we had a lot of freedom um, that you might think we wouldn't have um, artistically just for trying new things. Yeah, Norman, I, I just want to ask you some things that I, I think I learned watching the film. I've been a, such a huge fan, really, all of my life. I think, as we all have been, right? Yeah. <laughs> They, they didn't use it, but what I said to John Stewart when he said you raised us, I said that we went, to, we went, we took you to bed every night. <laughs> <laughs> we went to bed with you. <laughs> um, That's why they call you a Hollywood liberal because you say things like that. <laughs> <laughs> I I, uh, I haven't realized uh, your uh, experience before All in the Family and all the legendary shows with Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis and Martha Ray and Tennessee Ernie Ford and all these very kind of conventional shows for the time. When did, when did, when did your consciousness in comedy change so much? Uh, more of like social comedy as opposed to, you know, the more traditional that you had been working on. Oh, prior. you can't know how I love that question. <laughs> <laughs> because it leads me to a story. I, it's in the book, but uh, the crazy thing is, I wondered about that myself. How did this come about? And then in reading and researching my, in, as I was preparing the book and researching my life, I read about the very first Martin and Lewis, uh, D. Martin and Jerry Lewis Colgate Comedy Hour. It came at a time when uh, Hollywood the studio, major studios were afraid of television. And they had a giant campaign in theaters across the country. Movies are better than ever. Because they didn't want television to encroach on box office in theaters. Movies are better than ever. It was everywhere. The very first episode, the very first show, the Colgate Company out that we wrote, the very first scene had been as <laughs> had, had, had Dean Martin uh, managing a theater. I'm trying to remember her name, she was so hot. Yes, she was. <laughs> <laughs> guest star on the Marilyn Maxwell, the guest star on the on the show, and she played a an usherette. And Dean and they were outside in the box, at, at the box office. They were outside on the street because nobody was in the theater. And they were trying to get passers-by into the theater. This was the sketch, the first sketch. Jerry came along, bouncing a ball. And their job was to try to get him in the theater. And he didn't want to go in the theater. When he finally went in the theater, oh my god, it was too dark. And he was alone, and he came running out. And it was, it, you know, it was hilarious. But I was upset afterwards. Uh, I remember sitting with my agent, David Susskind, some of you remember that name, uh, complaining about how Jerry Lewis went off book and screwed up the sketch and <laughs> so forth. So forth. <laughs> what I discovered in reading the materials of that time as I was writing the book was that, because I had forgotten this totally, that the studios were so upset that they caused Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis to take out a full page ad in Daily Variety apologizing for the sketch. It had done its job. <laughs> and they were pissed. And they took out a full page ad. So my long-winded answer to your question is there was something on our minds from the very first from right, the very beginning. Right, right from the beginning. I was gonna ask you about working with Jerry Lewis. Uh, he's got kind of a reputation of being a little difficult to work with. I mean, we, we, the, the thing that we see in the movie was obviously a joke, but was, was he difficult to work with? The story that you just told kind of indicates well, that. We, Jerry tells his own story. <laughs> <laughs> when, uh, if you watch the muscular dystrophy telethons over the years, and uh, they began with one Jerry Lewis, and they finished 30 years later with another Jerry Lewis. And you can't tell the story better than he tells it when you watch 
how he changed over the years. He was, when we started, as funny as a, a, a human being as I think could possibly happen on this planet. We used to, in his uh, little playroom behind his house, uh, we would say, Jerry, you're uh, 62 years old and uh, with one leg. You're 62 <laughs> years, one leg, uh, you were born in Italy, raised in Switzerland. <laughs> you, know, you're, uh, you have a fingernail that's bothering you. <laughs> we would throw things at him and he would just, my God. <laughs> So, I mean, he gave me 30 years right there. <laughs> I was 27, I, but I knew clearly I had 57 <laughs> guaranteed from Jerry alone. Yeah. I, I have to ask about some of the, the characters, and I know we have just a limited time. No, we but, don't. But, <laughs> <laughs> from here right to the WGN Morning News tomorrow. <laughs> you see me wearing these same clothes tomorrow. Right? <laughs> um, you have created some of the greatest characters ever in the history of television. Did you have any idea, right? Did you have any idea of the, the magnitude that you were creating? Or was it, were you, was it just week to week you were just trying to turn out a show? Well, first of all, uh, mine was a giant collaboration. I didn't do any of this alone. You know, there were lots of writers and producers and directors and God, big town. I mean, I, when I, I think you have a little bit in here talking about when Archie, when Carol O'Connor came in and read the script, he read a page and I knew that was, if he would accept the role, that was Archie Bunker. Uh, now, when you write a character, you, everybody here is capable of imagining this. You write a character, the words are on paper, and they're funny, and it, it's, it's a character, everybody's gonna say, oh, that's, that's good, and so forth. But it's only when the actor, in this case, Carol O'Connor, sits down, and inhabits those words, that this miracle occurs, and there's Archie Bunker. It's, you know, it's overwhelming. And the same thing with Edith, and the same thing. I made the pilot in 1968 for ABC. Didn't change a word. They had the right to ask me to make it a second time a year later before they lost their option, and they did and I made it again. Same uh, Carol O'Connor and Gene Stapleton, two different young people. And then when CBS wanted to do it, I said, it has to be on the air. I'm not gonna do another pilot. They put it on the air. But that was the first time Sally Struthers and, uh, and Robert Reiner inhabited those two roles. So the best thing ABC could have done for me over the years. And they were adequate, and more than adequately, they were well played each time. But the miracle of, you know, the, the, the chemistry between Archie and Edith and Michael and Gloria and Gloria and Archie and Archie and, and everything. You know, nobody's responsible for that, but the fates, the heavens, whatever you believe in. I think that Jean Stapleton was one of the most underrated actresses of all time. Afterwards, talk, talk a little about that genius. Well, the first thing that comes to mind was uh, when somebody, the first time somebody asked me, uh, what's Jean Stapleton like? I said, she's always where she is. And that, I mean, that stayed with me. The first thing I think of when I think of Jane is she was always where she was. I thought about that as I was sitting there listening to myself talking about I had five families on the air and one on Mooncrest Drive. <laughs> and I wasn't there. Although I hate to be able to say I was. But you know, I was there sufficiently, we all got through, but, but Jane Stapleton taught me 
to be there. I'm here right now. Heard an interview with Rob Reiner where he said that uh, you were the first person ever to tell him that he was funny when he was a little boy. We saw the, the camaraderie between Mel Brooks and Carl Reiner and you. But um, my daughter Ellen and he are virtually the same age, you know, to the month. And uh, <laughs> we had, I had a cottage on Fire Island one summer and uh, Carl did too. We were about 30 feet from each other. <laughs> And the kids knew each other, and they're five, six years old. And uh, and Rob is on the floor with Ellen, teaching her how to play jacks. And he was saying, "No, no, I said we got the ball. Thank you, Six years old, and he was making the sounds of the Jewish comics. <laughs> I said to Carl, your, your kid is hilarious. <laughs> but the father's usually the last one. <laughs> uh, with, uh, with good times, you, you could have set that anywhere. We took a, a certain amount of pride here in Chicago. Okay, that, of, of all the places that you set that family, it was uh, Cabrini Green here in Chicago. Why did you do that? Because, uh, because uh, Eric Monte, who was one of the two black dudes who got uh, created by credit on there, came from Chicago and Cabrini Green. I wouldn't have known about Cabrini Green, but that came from Eric. Was it difficult? You got a sense of the difficulty of working that show. Uh, and I, I, it made me think about the evolution yeah. of all your shows and how really they all kind of change. And well, when you, cast when you think about it, I tried to say it, when you think about uh, uh, Florida and jo John Amos and Esther Rowe, they were playing the first uh, African-American parents uh, holding down a family on American television. And uh, I don't know how early on I, on I understood this, but I understood that their responsibility it, their true responsibility was enormous. And then there was a responsibility they felt as the particular human beings they were, which could have been skewed, like we are all skewed. Uh, so John Amos is quoted, he, he, he was incorrect there, saying that the, the way that the couple came about was Florida was the maid on Maud, right? And she was glorious, and they had a great relationship. And when we wanted to do uh, a, uh, a black family, and with Esther, as the, we brought in a husband. We cast John Amos uh, on an episode of Maud. And when that show was over, before the credits were running in New York, uh, I was on the phone with the network saying, there's a show in those two people. So that's how. Good times came about. Uh, one show spawning off of uh, another, right? Uh, yes. Jeff Jefferson's, Jefferson's coming off of All in the Family and Maude also. Right. Uh, coming off of uh, All, All in the Family. Well, they, they, I, I always thought about them as actors in the Bush Leagues who were ready for the majors. <laughs> I mean, of course, when we moved the Jeffersons next door to Archie, and they turned out to be gold. I mean, they're wonderful. Well, we didn't. We had Mrs. Jefferson, but we didn't have George for weeks and weeks and weeks and maybe months uh, until somebody, it could have been me, I, I, I think it was the casting on Somebody reminded me of, uh, of Sherman Hemsley, whom I had seen in uh, a show called Pearly in New York. And uh, somebody remembers her. Uh, and the minute that occurred to me, I knew I had George Jefferson, smaller than Archie, little bantam cock of a guy. Yeah. <laughs> but I want to talk more here. But forgive me. That's okay. I, mean, well, I, I, I also want to yes, ask about um, your decision 
in, in the creation of this film uh, to bring in so many personal parts of Norman's life. Some seemingly pretty painful personal parts of Norman's life. Talk about your decision to incorporate that. And I, I'm just curious, Norman, after they do, how, what it's like for you. I'm always so curious when famous people who either write books or their documentaries choose to share really painful parts of their life with me. I want to I didn't, know, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, know the answer. I didn't choose to, to share that. You chose to. <laughs> um, Damn it, you were the last one. You were part of the process. Well, um, Norman happened to have things happen to him in his life when he was nine and younger and a little bit older that when, after we read the galley of his book, we just kept seeing the same things over and over. In fact, we um, saw the father theme, which we didn't even include in the film, everywhere, which we'll let you know about sometime. It was everywhere. In other shows. In other shows, in, other shows in every episode, in this episode, and um, so we knew that it was, it was sort of, it was baked into the fabric of his storytelling and his worldview. And, um, you know, I, I feel like it's also the thing that makes him human and makes us all human, which is the things that happen to us when we're seven, eight, nine years old are basically, they create our characters. And that's why it was, you know, it, it was part of who, this, who he is as a person, as an artist. But, as but a, how about what happened to Francis Lear, not Norman Lear? You told that story. That's right. You know, also as storytellers, there's a responsibility, especially with someone who's, who's people feel like they know you, they know your shows, and, and so uh, the responsibility of the storyteller is also to, to bring to an audience something that they might not find out otherwise, to another layer of a person that is not on the surface, it's not on Wikipedia. So we really, there is so much so richness there in your personal story, and you know, your bumper sticker says, just another version of you, and the film is called Just Another Version of You, and all of those personal things that happen to you, painful and as they are, Make that's, you that's more like I, us, you know I, what I mean? I didn't, so I I didn't mind sharing it, and I love the way you handled all of that, thing, that painful stuff. Because I think we all go through versions of the same thing. There was, there's nothing about my story that everybody in this audience hasn't gone through versions of. We're, we're one. The scene 